What is up guys, my name is Cosmic and welcome to the video in which I rank the difficulty of every single boss within the Witcher 3 Wild Hunt and its DLC. Now there is 90 of them, so I gotta try and keep this video as short as I can. Please keep in mind this video is my opinion only and is in no way objective. Let me know in the comments if you had an easier or harder time with any of the bosses in the video and needless to say, there are spoilers of The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt and both of its DLCs throughout the entirety of this video. Now without further ado, buckle up and let's get started with number 90. Number 90, Gauntero Dim Master Mirror. Alright, considering the Mana Glass to be a boss fight might be a little nonsensical as you actually don't fight him straight on, but he's a major character and you, as Geralt, do actually kill him. The showdown with Master Mirror is a riddle. You run through a distorted world filled with illusions and baits to distract Geralt from the matter at hand, the stake being your soul. Once you run through the initial creepy area, you enter a church, and from there you discover that Gaunter is hiding within mirrors. After exhausting all the mirrors in the next area and having them disembodied voice of Master Mirror mocking you all the time, you find another way to capture him. When you're near the solution, Geralt gives you multiple hints as to what the answer is. And so, since there are no mirrors left, you cast Ard on the wall next to the well, releasing water and finding another reflection of the mana glass in the water, thus killing him. Number 89, Nathaniel Pastodi. This guy starts a slew of boss fights that are just like fighting a random bandit in the woods. It's just a duel between a standard human AI that are only differentiated from random mobs by having a special name. Amongst them all is Nathaniel Pastodi, a twisted individual that tortures women for his own pleasure and... <clears throat> entertainment. After what is actually quite a cool and unique questline, you catch Nathaniel in the act and after conversing with him a little, begin the duel. There's not any challenge to him, there's nobody to help him, and it's just a dude really. A messed up dude. You might as well just fight a random dude in the forest. Number 88, Ewald Bosodi. One of the most short-lived but interesting characters in the game, Ewald Bosodi is a mysterious individual that assists Geralt in getting the House of the Bosodis for Olgierd von Everek. After organizing a heist with him, you travel with him to infiltrate the Bosodi auction house with a master of locks and a gymnast? Once you reach the vault, you find out Ewald has been lying to you and you battle it out. Once again, really nothing special, just a dude with a special name that you duel. Shame really, but I hate getting lied to. Number 87, Caleb Menger, a commander soldier of the Church of the Eternal Fire that you and Triss travel to kill or interrogate to gain information of where he sent Dandelion. What can I say? Another dude that you duel. Nothing special differentiating him from a random bandit in the woods except for a special name and involvement in the story. Actually, this segment getting to Caleb is harder than this dude, but it's also damn fun melting through everybody with Triss. Number 86, Doppler. Alright, I actually have something special to say about this one. Since he's a Doppler, he can disguise himself as Geralt, and that's exactly what he does. He also utilizes the signs, defending himself with Quen and occasionally blowing you away with Ard. This, however, does not complicate the fight all too much. He's still susceptible to signs like Axie that makes the fight pretty damn easy. His health bar is also the size of an ant, so he dies really quickly even if you're underleveled. Number 85, Madman Lugos. We're pretty much done with the one-on-one -on -one bandit type duels, now we're onto the gank fights, and Madman Lugos takes the crown as the easiest of the bunch. This is because you get help from Ermion while fighting him and his soldiers, and since it's quite late into the game, you're most likely going to have upgrades on Geralt that can actually trivialize basic gank fights like this, such as Whirl or Rend. With the assistance of a strong mage such as Ermion and this, the fight with Madman Lugos is just as easy as you'd expect. This guy doesn't deserve much more than this joke of a fight anyway. Number 84, Sigismund Dijkstra. God damn it, Dijkstra, I like you, but I really just hate you. Kinda glad that I finally get to slaughter you. <sighs> just another gank. You also have Tala, Vess, and Roche helping you to exterminate Dijkstra and his men from this corruption. And hell, I'm glad I didn't find his treasure. Number 83, Doppelganger Wraith. This is similar to the fight with the Doppler, except there's also a Wraith of Kira with him. This fight is balanced because although the spirit of Kira is firing magic from afar, you also have the real Kira helping you to counter this. Once you kill the Wraith of Geralt, which is easy in and of itself, you can go and gank the spirit of Kira and kill her before she can do more than shout for Geralt when she sees a rat. Number 82, King Radovid. Long live the king, or not. This is also a strange one to consider a boss fight, as you do not actually directly fight Radovid himself, but you do have to get to him. 
What's stopping you from doing this are the hordes upon hordes of Redanian soldiers, a lot of them wielding the big shields which I find really annoying to get behind. If you have Rend or Spam Axie this is fine, but I still find them really annoying, and placing them all so close together in such big numbers makes this gank really annoying. Number 81, Horse Bosodi. After killing Ewald with him and his men, as well as the lockpicker you chose to hire, Horst offers you the House of the Bosodis, but without the documentation inside it. Declining this offer, you fight Horst, the lockpicker, and two shielded Redanian soldiers. This gank is pretty cool, and the arena is nice too, but that's about it. Nothing special to say about any of the members of the gank, and nothing really to differentiate it from the standard ones. I will tell you though, loot this area before you leave. It's a vault, it's got expensive things, and you can't come back here. Shiny money for you. Number 80, Von Everek Raids. Let me tell you, this boss does not live up to any other boss with the name of Von Everek in it. It's just a bunch of standard human AI ghosts. You may not get any assistance for the fight, but you really don't even need it. As I mentioned in the Madman Lugos fight, you pretty much only need World or Ren to trivialize this, and judging by the level requirement of Evil Soft first touches, I reckon you have either one of these by now. This boss leads up to one of the funniest and creative quests in the entire game though, so I guess that adds some sort of satisfaction to it. Number 79, Vision of Madman Lugos. Imagine, just imagine a vision of yourself being more challenging than your actual self. I find this fight to be more challenging than the ordinary gank because although you get assistance in both of them, you don't get help from a powerful mage in this one. Instead, you get the help of a few swordsman skelligers. Number 78, Berserkers. A bunch of bears. Bears that you fought numerous times throughout the game so far and have hopefully had no trouble with. Combine this and the fact that you're assisted by a ton of skelligers, including Madman Lugos, Krak on Crate, Yalmar on crate, Holger Blackhand, Ceres on crate, and Dona on Hindar. It makes for a pretty damn easy endeavor, if you ask me. Number 77, Vision of Eredin, King of the Wild Hunt. Geralt's greatest fear in the Cave of Dreams manifests into the Shadow Spirit version of the King of the Wild Hunt, Eredin himself. What's unusual and intimidating about this fight is that there's this big red skull above Eredin's spirit that indicates you are dangerously underleveled to fight him. But this isn't actually the case, and he doesn't one-shot you as you'd expect from a mob accompanied by that icon. Another thing is, you don't even need to fully deplete his health bar, the fight ends before you even expect it. Number 76, Ulrich and the Fallen Knights. Couldn't give a shit about your grief. Not the tiniest, runniest, greenest little shit in the world. That pretty much sums up this fight. The archers and the users of the crossbows can be annoying and can deal some pretty big damage, but as I said with most ganks, Whirl and Rend can absolutely trivialize this encounter. Not really, not much more to say. Number 75, the Apiarian Phantom. I wanted to put this guy a little higher on the list, but I actually really suck at fighting Hounds of the Wild Hunt. First of all, the Apiarian Phantom just runs away from you and you have to use Roach to catch him. I thought this fight was going to be a boring cat and mouse chase where you had to hit him from the back of Roach, but in fact, it's just a boring chase until you fight a single individual Hound of the Wild Hunt. And from the experience with Nithral, you should be well educated and should know how to fight these guys easy peasy. Number 74, Basilisk. Not much more to say about this fight either. The Basilisk is one of those creatures that just gets reskinned and made into other bosses throughout the game. This OG Basilisk just so happens to be the easiest. The thing about these creatures is that they stagger really, really easily, so you can literally just spam attacks on them and have them stagger every single time, making the fight pretty damn easy. You just have to know when to back up for a little while before retaliating sometimes. Even then his attacks don't do that much damage and you should kill this guy in no time. Number 73, Abaya the Water Hag. This is literally just a fight with a water hag in a dark cave with some drowner ads added in for good measure. Abaya's health pool is pretty small, deals pretty lackluster damage and can be taken down pretty easily. Only thing to really watch out for are those drowners that can gank you and stun you out of any sign casting or long attacks you may throw at her. You can choose to go all out on Abaya or take out the drowners before going for her, but either way, it's a pretty simple fight that you shouldn't have any trouble with at this point in the game. Number 72, the King of Wolves. This fight is made much easier by the fact that you play as Siri. No matter what difficulty you play on, be it just the story or death march, you always have some super overpowered gear when you play as Siri. Despite the werewolf being quite agile, Siri also has ways to move around this cave very quickly and catch up to him, making punish him and killing him a pretty easy task. 
Number 71, Salma the Succubus. At first, this fight can seem a little intimidating with her having some powerful magic attacks that destroy her basement that she seems to care so dearly for, but the truth of it is, with the arena being so small, the distance in which she can exploit that magic is extremely limited. There are no gaps for you to close, you can easily walk up to her in a matter of seconds and punish her. This combined with the fact her health bar is pretty small and that her attacks aren't crazy powerful, makes this fight pretty easy. Number 70, Hagumban the Necker Warrior. Hooray, another gank boss. Hagumban is a Necker Warrior, a stronger version of the standard Neckers. In the case of this contract, the warrior summons three separate waves of standard ones to come and kill you based on his health percentage. Providing how good you are at fighting ganks and how well educated you are of each of the signs, this fight should be absolutely no problem. It's just very slow very boring and not fun and bad. Number 69, Woodland Spirit, the Leshen. I love the designs of Leshens and Spriggans. In appearance, they look somewhat sentient with very slow and delayed movements, almost as if they are reluctant to fight you. Two special things about Leshens are that they can conjure roots from the ground to attack you from a distance, or they can close this distance by disappearing into mist and crows and warping closer to Geralt. All of this and the fact that the health bar could be pretty girthy depending on when you come here can actually make this fight semi-challenging. However, there is one thing you can do that absolutely trivialize it. Use of Igni. It's literally a tree, what do you expect? Number 68, Mount Hart the Grave Hag. Basically a water hag except it likes dead bodies instead of water and it throws dirt at you instead of a blob of liquid. This one is encountered later in the game, meaning the damage and health are upscaled over that of its counterparts. Its dialogue is cool, I guess, but that's about it. Number 67, the Witch of Lynx Krag. Think Salma the Succubus, except in a slightly bigger arena and with a kitty. You can choose to go all out on the witch or cry while you put down the kitty and then deal with her. I recommend this as it means the fight isn't a gank and your sign castings and heavy attacks will not be interrupted. Again, although she's a mage, she doesn't have the biggest arena and this means her attacks can't be used at much of a distance and can be punished pretty easily. Number 66, Nithral the Wild Hunt. Oh boy, our first Wild Hunt general. I must say, I'm actually a huge fan of the run up to this fight and the fight itself. This battle with the General of the Wild Hunt is pretty easy, but it can cause problems if you're just starting out with the game. For an early game fight, Nithral introduces the player perfectly to enemies that are slow and hit hard, and how to deal with them. With Kira helping you along the way, something that makes this fight easier, Nithral will go invulnerable multiple times during the fight, healing himself and conjuring portals to NL, which Hounds of the Wild Hunt will come through. Upon the defeat of each wave, Nithral will become vulnerable once more, exponentially taking more damage each time this happens. All in all, the fight isn't too challenging, and it's probably the least memorable out of every fight with a General of the Wild Hunt, but I appreciate this fight for being a nice tutorial boss for what comes up later in this fantastic game. Number 65, High of Vampire. You may think turning invisible is an awesome power, especially in a battle with a Witcher, but is it really when you don't actually turn invisible? The battle with this High of Vampire bluffing in cooperation with Nathaniel Pastodi is just a matter of dodging initial attacks and then punishing after you get dove. He goes invisible, but as I said, he's still very easy to spot. You should just watch out, dodge his initial pounces, and you're good to go. Only reason he's not high on this list is because he can actually hit you pretty hard, but just don't get hit, lol. Number 64, the Big Bad Wolf. I love this quest, and I love the place in which this quest takes place. The Big Bad Wolf is the wolf from the Little Red Riding Hood story. After fetching a red robe for Sienna, she goes full cosplay and masquerades as Little Red Riding Hood herself. After admiring the several large features the wolf has, he decides it's time to eat Geralt and Sienna. He's basically just a werewolf though, similar to Morkvarg and the King of Wolves. The Big Bad Wolf is in very late game, in the DLC to be exact, so his damage and health is all upscale to suit this, and that's why he's this low on the ranking list. Number 63, Noonwraith, the Devil by the Well. I hate raids. I'm too obsessed with teleporting and escaping my Yurden, and I find them infuriating to fight sometimes, especially if they regenerate or have very girthy health bars. Despite the Devil by the Well being quite early game, she can cause quite the problem for anyone very new, or anyone that grabs his contract super early. The key to fighting raids, noon raids, and banshees are to cast Yirden on the ground, turning them into their manifest form. If you don't do this, you're relying on RNG to really deal any damage to them. In spirit form, they absorb the vast majority of damage that heads their way from Geralt. They're definitely my top 5 least favourite enemies to fight in this game, and there's 9 reskinned Wraith bosses. God damn it. Number 62, Igni Fatus. You know how I just said I hate raids? 
Well, something I hate even more than raids are goddamn foglets. Ignifatus is a green foglet that has quite a girthy health bar and for someone that hasn't encountered a foglet yet can cause quite the issue. I think foglets are just really annoying to fight because their iframes can be quite unpredictable and they send out clones of each other to gank you. Thankfully these clones die in one hit but having three different separate foglets attacking you at any one time means that finding a window to hit them without getting staggered can be quite the challenge. But once you get to know how to deal with foglets it won't be too annoying but I just god damn I hate them I hate them. Number 61, Morgvarg the Werewolf. Another reskin, how exhilarating. Morgvarg's is another werewolf like the big bad wolf and the king of wolves, except this one is early game and is most likely the first one you battle. I think this adds some difficulty because actually finding a window to punish werewolves in combat as Geralt efficiently can be tough. Once he's on the floor though, the real puzzle begins. I won't spoil anything, but there's a certain item you have to acquire that truly kills him, and until you find this item, you have to fight him every single time you re-enter the arena, potentially making this one fight multiple. Obviously, once you've fought him once or twice, it gets much easier though. Number 60, Jenny of the Woods. Just another wraith. Cast your Urden, get it into manifest form, and punish it. Jenny the Woods, however, actually has something semi-unique to it. Upon getting its health bar to certain percentages, it will disappear and send out clones of itself while it heals up. This can make the fight quite lengthy and strenuous, adding significant difficulty to it. She's also quite early game, so be sure to grab this contract a little later to avoid having a weapon break because the fight is so long. Number 59, Melusine the Siren. Although I don't dislike these things as much as I dislike Foglets and Raids, it's certainly an annoyance. This Siren, however, cannot be shot to the floor with your crossbow unlike Harpies and some other Sirens. Instead, you have to bait a hit from her to be able to do any substantial damage. If she misses a charge on Geralt, she'll just hover there for a minute and lie to beat her up, essentially. You can whittle her health down slightly using the crossbow in between charges, but make sure not to get hit by her, because damn if she hurts. The charge attack has some pretty obvious tells, though, so dodging shouldn't be a problem. If you come here as soon as you get the level requirement, her health bar can be quite hard to surmount, but that shouldn't be an issue either if you come here slightly later. Number 58, Heim. Not sure what the deal is with the Heim, but he's kind of like a Leshen or a Spriggan. Slow and sentient with attacks that are delayed and simple to dodge, but hit like a freight train. Just like the Leshens and Spriggans, it's a case of ensuring you absolutely do not get hit by utilizing Quen and dodging appropriately. His health bar can be quite big too, which can be an issue if you do not have Whirl or Rend. But if you can dodge effectively and use Quen, the Heim shouldn't be too much of an issue. Honestly, I think I have a harder time actually looking at the thing and finding it than I do fighting it, but I will give it credit for killing me a few times on my very first playthrough of The Witcher 3. Number 57, Cursed Mother. Not much to say about this boss, it's another reskin of the raids, and it's essentially a harder version of Jenny the Woods. Based on her health percentage, she'll split up into multiple weaker raids while she heals up. She does this multiple times, so be sure to cast Yurden when it matters most. Cursed Mother is a boss that you can actually encounter, like, accidentally, so I put her this low on the list because she actually caught me off guard and killed me once or twice on my first playthrough. Number 56, The Heart of the Tree. Think Dark Souls, Bed of Chaos, but less unfair and far less bullshit. The heart protects itself with a barrier similar to Quen, spawning waves upon waves of Andruga to gank you. At the end of each wave, you have the opportunity to destroy the branches it uses to protect itself and deal a lot of damage to the heart. Other than that, there's not much more to this fight. It's a stationary, bulbous sack that can't really defend itself very well. I put the heart this down on the list because the Endriga can cause an issue in ganks if you're really low level, and it can be quite awkward to find a winner to destroy the branches that get a hit on it sometimes. Number 55, Gollum. The fights with Gollums are normally a stamina game more than anything. Frequently, they'll protect themselves with their arms and completely absorb every point of damage you deal to them in a short amount of time before retaliating with a fast attack. In the time you can't deal damage to it, you have to make sure you have your dodges down or that you have a nice quench shield active all the time. Golems share a characteristic with Leshens and Spriggans in that they are slow in their attacks generally, but they will hit pretty damn hard. Manage your windows as best you can and you shouldn't have too much trouble, but whittling down their often a large health pool can be troublesome when they frequently protect themselves. Number 54, Pesta. Another reskin. Cast Yirden and kill her. Hit her with your sword. She does more damage than the other raids. Number 53, Kernon the Leshen. A, uh... <coughs> a reskin. Much like the Woodland Spirit, this Leshen rests silently in the woods defending its territory. Also similarly, he disappears into crows in an attempt to ambush you with some quick attacks with fast recovery times. 
Honestly, just trivialize the fight by using Igni. In the footage I'm showing you, I haven't actually dedicated any sort of upgrade whatsoever into Igni, and it's absolutely destroying him. Even without it, the fight is pretty simple if you can get the dodges down, but Igni, a sign that I never really find particularly useful in the vast majority of circumstances, makes this fight a joke. I actually put him further down on this list because he has killed me in my first playthrough, and damn, they do hit like a truck if they do manage to get a hit on you. Number 52, Slave Knight, Gale the Catacan. To get this beast to show itself, Geralt consumes probably an unhealthy amount of alcoholic beverages and makes a racket in the streets. Once was a maid from Vico Varro, tight at night she'd be loose come morrow. Early in the morning. After a while, Gale finally shows himself with lust for the witch's blood. Fighting him is just like fighting the higher vampire from earlier. He goes invisible, but not really, and the fight is pretty straightforward. That is, until you get him to 50% HP. Here, he runs to a hut on the docks, and you have to run and finish him off. Again, this is pretty straightforward, and you shouldn't have any problems. I put Gale this far down on the list because he actually hits pretty hard, and Katakans can hit some pretty solid damage pretty quickly, so if you die a few times, I wouldn't worry. Number 51, Wyvern. Let me tell you now that the footage I'm showing you does not do this guy justice. Wyverns can be one of the most painful enemies to fight in the game. They throw goop at you that causes you to bleed for a while, fly around the place making it difficult for you to get a hit on them, retaliate with some very quick attacks with poor tells, and as I said can be a real pain in the ass to fight early game. Just try and keep your distance and bait some easy to punish attacks and you can whittle down their small health bars pretty quickly. Number 50, Earth Elemental. The guardian under the mask of Ouroboros is a sleeping Earth Elemental, a creature that's slow and pretty easy to dodge but hits like a bus. He's pretty much a reskin of the Golem boss from earlier on, except scaled for a little later game. He defends himself often, similar to what you had to deal with before, so you shouldn't have too many problems, unless he hits you and sunlocks you of course, which he can do if he charges at you and swings twice. His appearance is God awful, too. He's just a lump of rock with arms and legs. Number 49, Sarasti the Ekimara. This fight really caught me off guard the first time I encountered it. It's a reskin of Gale and the Higher Vampire, except this one has seemed to give me more trouble than the others. The arena for this fight just feels weird. There's broken pillars in the center of the room that often obstruct my dodges. The room itself feels smaller than it looks, and this makes the fight with this agile Ekimara quite challenging. Timing your dodges correctly are essential for Ekimara fights, and having things in the center of the room that obstruct that make it so much harder. I struggle to dodge these things sometimes, and when they do hit you, they can hit really hard as well. Combining this and the small cluttered arena makes this fight harder than its predecessors. Number 48, Howl of the Chort. If we want to talk about bulky bosses, we got ourselves one right here. After baiting the creature to the cave, you finally go head to head with it, and this thing is basically just a blob of HP. For the most part, his attacks are slow and quite easy to dodge, as with a lot of bosses, but he hits pretty hard if you get hit by one of them. He does have an attack that he performs if you're behind him or extremely close to him, where he slices with his claws horizontally. This attack will stun you with ungenerous hitboxes, and he could potentially follow up with a lethal attack. Try to watch out for this, whittle down his massive health bar, play the stamina game, and you should be good to go. Number 47, Luzi the White Lady Noonwraith. Short and sweet, is an exact reskin of Jenny of the Woods and Cursed Mother. She splits up to heal, but it's scaled for a later game, meaning she does more damage and heals more quickly. Number 46, Fire Elemental and Philippa Isleheart. Some of you may put this boss lower on the list, and I would too if I made this list right after my first playthrough. The thing that makes this fight so infuriating on a first playthrough is its goddamn flame AoE. It's similar to the Smelter Demons from Dark Souls 2. If you get too close to it, it'll slowly whittle your health down for some pretty significant AoE damage, and Geralt will continue to burn even after retreating. Along with this AoE, you have to avoid the electric magic from Philippa, who resides on the platform above. This isn't too difficult, as there's an extremely obvious purple indicator on the ground showing you where she's striking, but having that there means you can't retreat in that direction if the elemental gives you any trouble. I've deducted major points from this boss because once you know you can douse its flames temporarily with Axie, this fight becomes a standard one with an elemental such as the Golem and Earth one from earlier. The only difference is this one has some pretty easy to avoid magic added on as well. Number 45, Eridan, King of the Wild Hunt. This... This is the final boss of The Witcher 3. The king, the general of the villainous gang that this game's been hyping up for possibly hundreds of hours, is at the halfway point of the ranking. 
This video is just my opinion, as I said, but honestly, I think he's unanimously a very disappointing and very easy final boss. Two of his generals are still to come on this list? The fight isn't even that good either. He does bare minimal damage considering it's an endgame fight, is extremely slow to attack you sometimes, and often just stands there awkwardly for a while mocking you. After you've dealt a little bit of damage to him, he'll teleport you to an icy arena away from the boats and the fire. This is where he actually uses some special moves, like one where he teleports to one end of the arena and will try to hit Geralt with many attacks like a wave of ice or eruptions from afar. Every single one of these can be dodged by literally strafing left or right. Sadly, I can't say much more about this boss. It's definitely disappointing considering the build up to it, but thank god the incredible story and ending of this game compensates for it. Number 44, The Hermit, Lady of the Lake. So, this one is similar to Salma and the Witch of Link's Crag in the fact that it's a mage that will stand there and throw ranged magic attacks at you from a distance. The difference with this one is that the arena is much bigger and cooler. This gives space for the Hermit to attack you from a distance and forces you to close the large gap to punish him. And he has some very big AoE attacks like a horizontal whirlpool looking one. His attacks hit much, much harder than previous mages and have much larger AoEs. And it's a pretty challenging fight if you can't close the gaps. Once you defeat him though, the Lady of the Lake bequeaths upon Geralt the Arendite. Number 43, Royal Griffin. The first boss in the whole game comes up just under the halfway point in the ranking. Why? Because he's the first boss. When you fight the Royal Griffin for the first time, you're likely really inexperienced with the combat of The Witcher 3, which I would say is quite complex compared to most of the games. Not only that, but Vesemir hands you the crossbow just before the fight begins, something you have no idea how to use because it was just handed to you. The Griffin can tank a good few hits, and since Geralt has a minimal moveset at this point in the game unless on New Game Plus, this can make it somewhat lengthy and will cause some issues for brand new players. Number 42, Arachnomorph Colossi. I hate these things. They're so sporadic and move so quickly and unpredictably, it can be a real mission getting a hit on them. The Colossi version of these Arachnomorph enemies is absolutely no exception. This thing runs around so damn much, it feels like more of a fight reaching it than it is to actually fight it. The only time it stops scuttling around is to spew saliva at you, which stuns you, is poorly coordinated and hard to dodge, which means it just runs away again right after doing it. Make this fight a gank and you've got yourself one infuriating cat and mouse chase until you're finally able to stun lock it in a corner. Number 41, the three bears. Probably another kind of surprising one. Why is a gank of bears ranked so low in the list? It's for a couple of reasons. I die to these guys three times on my first death march playthrough while in full Ursine armor, which is heavy armor. These bears deal so much damage it's unreal and with there being three of them, one of which being a cub, it makes this fight genuinely challenging if you aren't prepared for it. Not to mention that their health bars are each equivalent to that of a double-decker bus. Combining all these factors makes the fight with the three bears genuinely annoying and somewhat challenging. Number 40, Iocast, the Silver Basilisk. I've said before that Basilisks can be a real pain in the ass to fight, and the Iocast just reinforces my point even more. This Silver version has some different attacks that have some of the most ungenerous hitboxes that will hit you really hard. When I say I really suck at fighting these things, I mean it. This is a creature that will absolutely punish you for just mindlessly swinging at it. Although for this Basilisk in particular, you get some assistance, they are completely useless and really won't make the fight any easier at all, and will only really do anything if you purposely lead the Basilisk to them. The two redeeming factors to this fight is that he doesn't like Igni very much and healing isn't all too problematic by just backing up. I highly recommend getting White Rafford's decoction for fights like these, it's very useful for the whole game and Swallow doesn't really do very much if enemies do DOT. Number 39, Spoon Collector, the Spotted White. Species of the Spotted Whites is one that witches actually drove to extinction. Or so they thought. This one sits in a house in Toussaint in literally a fucking bath of spoons. It wears spoons all over its body, including its head, it's decorated its house with spoons, hanging them from the ceiling on chains and diversing them on shelves. This trickster of a necrophage has so many spoons in his arena he can literally sink in them and teleport around. Anyway, the difficulty of this fight is a mixture of how damn bulky this thing is and how often he teleports around. Sometimes he'll teleport generously, other times he'll just do it so much you can't get a single hit on him. 
So this is pretty RNG based, but regardless of what he does, he tanks so many hits and retaliates so quickly with solid damage, this fight can be pretty long and pretty painful, and undoubtedly much, much harder if you face him early. I never really enjoy fights that feel RNG based, and this one really does. Good news is, you don't need to kill him as part of the quest, so if you want to let the little guy live happily with his spoons, then go for it. It's one of those bosses that I've only actually fought twice. Never. Never again. Number 45, Morvut the Fiend. I really like this fight. It's pretty unique and it feels a lot like a Dark Souls boss. Sorry for the Dark Souls comparisons. A lot of its really hard hitting attacks like the charge have some obvious tells and require you to nail your dodge timings in order to not get hit for massive damage. Its claw attacks are like this to a lesser degree but don't feel too rapid to be undodgeable. Once you get his health bar down to 50% he'll hypnotize you, limiting your vision for a while. As Geralt says, he leaves you to go and lick his wounds or to heal up. Using a Witcher senses, you must track him down and finish him off. The fight is no different here, just a different arena. His hypnotizing attack is really unique and although Geralt is left completely helpless without being able to use any of his abilities during this time, I think it adds a really nice aspect to the fight that requires nailing dodge timings and really analyzing the Fiend's moveset, which is something I can't really say for most of the other bosses in this game. Number 37, Royal Wyvern. Also, I just noticed up until this point, if you dislike how I pronounce Wyvern, deal with it. But what can I say? It's another Wyvern. But the addition of the word Royal in its name honestly does mean something. It means it has more health, it deals more damage, it's a lot bigger, and is even more of a pain in the ass to fight than the lesser Wyverns. Thankfully, you can still shoot him out of the sky before he does the flyby attacks, which makes it easier, but the damage he does and the amount that he poisons you can make for a very irritating and tough fight. Number 36, the three little pigs. Hey, I just want to point out that this boss was harder than the final boss of the game. Do not underestimate these three little guys. There are three reasons why they are so low on this list. Firstly, they have a ton of HP. I understand that in the footage I was using a sword that was nearly broken, but still, god damn, they can tank some hits. Secondly, they hit like freight trains. I remember I died to these things twice on my first death march playthrough, and ever since then I've been genuinely terrified of embarrassing myself again. And thirdly, and probably the most important reason, they run around so damn much it makes it aggravating to try and get any hits on them. All of these reasons combine to make a very slow and kind of annoying battle. Not to mention how useless Sienna is. I'm surprised she even knows how to swing a sword. If you think this boss is easier than number 36, I give you full permission to relentlessly scold me for it in the comments. Number 35, the Forktail Dragon of Firesdal. Look, I'm gonna be honest, I'm writing the script by myself, and I'm really getting tired of writing about the damn reskins. So I'll state the obvious, this guy is ranked so low because he's scaled for endgame, and he's also an optional mini boss. so you could run into him super early and get absolutely decimated by him. But despite all this, please, a moment of silence for the sheep that we took to him. If you can keep this sheep alive, you're a god among men. Number 34, Alpha Garcane. I still don't understand this boss, really. I'm not sure if you can dodge a couple of his attacks, like his deafening AoE, although I've never actually tried just running away from it. Similarly to a lot of the beasts this side, his counterattacks come so quickly it's nearly impossible to predict and block accordingly, and he'll probably still knock you into a few sipes that will do a good bit of damage to you. You can see in the footage that he's extremely easy to stun lock, but the amount of bulk this boss has means that you can't keep doing it for long before he'll inevitably swipe back at you. Not to mention that every single time he hits you, you'll get poisoned, so healing with anything other than the White Rapids decoction is a no-go. He often leaps up into the air and slams back down onto the ground, so the only thing you can use to get used to these attacks is his shadow. All in all, with some pretty hard-hitting and rapid attacks, the Alpha Gar Kane will definitely cause a few people's deaths. Number 33, Phantom of the Amphitheater. What did I tell you about all these Wraith reskin bosses? Yeah, we've got another one of them, so I can just get through it pretty quickly. The quest associated with it, but other than that, how did you enjoy the play, is arguably the easiest way to get the Wisdom Chivalric Virtue for the Erendite, and that's the only reason I ever do this treasure hunt in the first place. And as I've always said as justification for putting specific reskin bosses like this lower on the list, you encounter it accidentally sometimes, and it has damage and health scale for endgame. 
Number 32, Bruxa. I really wish I could say this boss is cool, but I can't. Unless I'm missing something or misstrategizing with them, it's pretty irritating to fight any of these things. And I say these things because there are multiple of them dispersed throughout the DLC. Not one of them is less annoying than the other. They go invisible and become invulnerable for a short amount of time while unleashing a relentless fury of attacks of Geralt. This is pretty easy though, since you can just block them, but where this fight can be a pain in the ass is how many windows you have to attack them. The roar is always a good time to get a hit or two in, but you have to be in the right position to do this. If you're good at hitting her and she's swiping at you, you can get some crit damage done, but this isn't exactly easy. Often you can be swinging at her and you'll trade blows though, which is worth it since she doesn't have the most health in the world. The Bruxa deals pretty decent damage and the attacks she unleashes when she isn't invisible can be tough to dodge or parry, and these moments are where you'd want to swing aimlessly anyways unless you want the fight to last two years. As I mentioned, there are multiple of these throughout the DLC, so once you fight one, the fight with the others will definitely go much faster, but they're still annoying as hell to fight, and it's something I really don't get excited for when replaying Blood and Wine. Number 31, Karanthir of the Wild Hunt. This one may be slightly controversial in placement, and my justification for it is probably terrible, not gonna lie. Honestly, I think it's just because I suck at this fight. More specifically, I suck at fighting the elementals he summons, but we'll get to them. Karanthir is the only boss in the game that you fight as both Siri and Geralt, with Geralt jumping in when Karanthir reaches 70% HP. The first phase with Siri can be pretty simple, but goddamn if Karanthir hates staying still. He's teleporting from one place to the other every two seconds and it can make the fight, as I said with the spotted white, a little annoying. Thankfully this doesn't last long before Geralt joins the gang and takes on Karanthir himself. The general now has access to multiple new attacks like one where he summons a portal above him and conjures an ice elemental. I honestly was getting one shot by these elementals on my first deathmatch playthrough and I was in full mastercrafted Ursine armor. They have insane bull considering they're made of ice, they turn the fight into a gank and he can continuously summon them. I had three coming at me at once on my first playthrough and it made it so tough to even see where Karanthia was, it led to my death a couple of times. Aside from his elementals, he has access to a sort of soul mass attack that is poorly telegraphed, and he can send these out in either a group of five or one individually. They do a hefty amount of damage and inflict frost damage and slow down onto you, which can make closing the gap between you and him much more difficult. The caveat is that each of his attacks have a wind up time, so if you can get in and hit him before he unleashes the attack, you can deal big damage to him and also get a few swings in while he's staggered. So if you get good at closing the distance on him, which is most easily done by ignoring the ice elementals, he's not the bulkiest boss in the game, so interrupting his build ups to deal big damage to him will make the fight pass in no time. Number 30, Shrieker. Think Basilisk, but with 8 million times more aggression and bleed damage. I remember on my first deathmatch playthrough, this guy drove me insane because I insisted on playing recklessly without adapting to the fact that he guards himself and retaliates with almost instant attacks that cause bleeding and can stun you. I kind of dislike how quickly he shields with his wing because if you're hitting him and he does this, it's almost instant. So you could be halfway through his swing and he'll just insta block and retaliate with an attack that hurts very, very hard. Salt is added to the wound because you can't heal with Swallow, so you have to heal with White Raffid's decoction. Seems to be a pattern with these Wyverns and Basilisks. Number 29, Daphne the Banshee. Still not done with the Wraith reskins, and we still have three more to go after this one. Daphne though starts the few that are pretty unique in their design. They're still weak to Yerdon as always, but Daphne is faster than the others, has access to a scream that will summon skeletons to come and gank you. But that's about it. Just spam Yerdon and kill these skeletons in a few hits. And as always, I'll mention it again, she's this far down on the list because of the gank and the fact that her damage and health is scaled for later game. Number 28, the Arch Griffin. Take the Shrieker from before, make it more bulky, and you've got yourself the Arch Griffin. I really hate not being able to say much about the bosses as we go further down the list, but reskins are exhausting, and I can't really say much more about them without repeating myself. This one has more health, and it deals more damage than the others. Number 27, Whamma Wham the Rock Troll. This thing attacks you before you even know about it. Your initial intentions as you walk into the cave is to talk to it about the miners that I quote, it whammed. After you interrogate him, you get the choice whether to let him off or to fight the poor thing. I fought him three times now, and on my first playthrough especially, he gave me quite a thrashing. Maybe I just sucked at the game, or I just suck fighting the rock trolls, but I found him so unpredictable and his attacks seemed to deal 70% of my health bar. 
One thing that makes fighting these things so difficult is the fact that you can't hit the back or the arms if they cover them up. So the only place you can deal damage is from its front, where, needless to say, most of the attacks come from. It doesn't have that much health, but having your windows for attack narrowed down by so much by his arms make the fight pretty difficult as you need to know when to back up and take it easy. You don't see it in the footage, but there's an attack where he can just blindly run forward, unleashing a frenzy of attacks with his arms that I swear to god will one-shot you on death march no matter what you're wearing. Number 26, Jin. This thing is a cloud of smoke. Icy, electric smoke. And let me tell you something, I have been very generous with this boss's placement. If you have enemy upscaling on, it will one-shot you with almost every attack it has, and I mean it. I actually gave up killing this thing on my first playthrough because I was just not having fun. I'm not sure why, maybe the game classes the Jin as a normal enemy so it decides to scale it up with you? I'm not sure, but with that setting on, my attempt to kill it on my livestream was an hour and 14 minutes long because the only way I could do anything was just by standing behind the master in the center of the boat and waiting for Quen to replenish. Because of this, he was really hard to rank. This entire video was pretty hard to rank if I'm honest, but I sailed with here because even without getting one shot consistently, he's just absolutely relentless with his attacks. He just doesn't stop sometimes. I'm not sure if you're even supposed to dodge them, but they seem so sporadic and unpredictable, I'm not entirely sure what Project Red wanted us to do here. It's a pretty annoying boss that will absolutely cause some issues for people, and do yourself a favor and turn off enemy upscaling in the options if you're playing on any difficulty higher than just the story, at least for this fight. Number 25, the Crones of Crookback Bog. As is the nature with most ganks in any game involving a lot of bosses, having the battle be 3 versus 1 adds a substantial amount of difficulty to the fight and is definitely, to me, the hardest one in Siri. The Brewess isn't much of a problem due to how slow she is and her lack of ability to do anything but stand there taking hits, but the Wispess and the Weavess can absolutely cause a problem or two with their irritating persistency and their ability to get around the arena and cover distance on you, or in some cases, hit you with ranged attacks. Siri's power can help with the gank aspect of it, but for some reason they can still hit you even if you're flying around about all over the place, and since you're Siri, the only way to heal is to not get hit for a while, which of course is difficult since you're dealing with more than one enemy. One of the few fights in the game that will demand some sort of efficient camera management and one that'll test your skills and the use of Siri's powers. And after all of this, the Weaver steals your amulet and buggers off with it. Way to make the fight even more annoying. Number 24, Penitent. Hooray, another Wraith! Good luck dealing any significant damage to this one at the start though. The battle with the penitent is just a time game. You're waiting for Mikyal to light the brazier in the lighthouse. And what do you know, the fight turns into a gank after 30 seconds with additional wraiths joining the party. Exactly what we needed. The goal at the beginning of this slog of a battle is to take out the adds while also making sure you don't take any damage from the penitent itself as it hurts quite a bit and you want as much as your health available for the final segment. Once Mikyal lights the brazier, the penitent will disappear and summon 6 wraiths all at once to come and attack you. If you suck at fighting these things like I do, then it'll be really irritating having to kill all of them once they've spawned, however each one takes a chunk of health off the penitent. If you manage to kill all of them, the penitent will respawn and you can kill it just by spamming it. The nature of the fight and having it be a gank with some persistent and stunlock masterful enemies, it makes the penitent an annoying stamina game sometimes and it will definitely cause a lot of problems for a lot of players. Number 23, Old Spear Tip, the Cyclops. The embodiment of bizarre hitboxes that can be generous or ungenerous, this Cyclops is a somewhat sporadic brute that runs around in this small cave trying to pull his punches at Geralt and Lambert. The thing that adds so much difficulty to this fight is the unpredictability of him and his hitboxes. Like, come on, you're telling me this punch hits me, but amongst all of this, I don't get hit? What's with that? Anyway, Project Red utilized the bullet sponge mechanic again here. The footage doesn't do it justice really, but this guy on Death March can attack more hits than most of the bosses before it and will punish you with, as I said, some unpredictable and hard hitting punches. And honestly, compared to all the other bosses before it, that's reason enough to put him this low on the list. The problem with ranking bosses like this in a game like Witcher 3 is the scaling with difficulty. A lot of them scale incredibly high from Blood and Broken Bones to Death March and seemingly void some of my justification for them being lower down. From my experience and from looking at this boss closely, it's undoubtedly in the harder tiers and quite frankly, a lot of this game's bosses are fairly easy. And I'm sure that statement is unanimous. Number 22, Longlocks. One of the very few forgivable Wraith reskin bosses, Longlocks resides at the very top of the tower in the Land of a Thousand Fables. She's a sarcastic representation of Rapunzel, but unfortunately, Geralt can't rescue this damsel in distress because she's already hung herself with her hair. 
Morbid. The strategy here is similar to what it is with the others. Yerdin is a big help and Rend can definitely assist in dealing chunks and chunks of damage. At certain intervals though, she will scream a purple aura, disappear into mist, and then skeletons will jump in from the railings. These skeletons. These goddamn skeletons. They stagger easily, but they hit harder than Eridin does. Not only that, but it's a gank, so if you don't have Whirl, you're gonna have a very, very tough time with this one. And as always, on Death March, these things seem to have more health than most enemies in the game and they shamelessly gank you. And on top of all of this, Longlocks will reappear twice more with a more varied moveset than Raids and Banshees than that she's a reskin of, then disappears and summons yet more skeletons. I'm not gonna say much more. The damage is insane, the gank is annoying, the skeletons are tanky, and that's it for the penultimate Wraith reskin of the list. Number 21, Grotore the Spriggan. Although we're getting lower on the list and I really should be talking more about why the bosses are getting harder, I can't really talk very long about the reskins as per usual. The Spriggan is basically a reskin of the Leshens from earlier, but once again, its damage and health is scaled way higher than its predecessors and it's found somewhat late in the Blood and Wine DLC. This one also does not share the weaknesses to Igni, so it makes one of the aspects that trivializes its friends completely unviable. But what really brings this much lower on the list is the addition of arguably the most irritating enemy in the entire game, Arcaspores. These are all around the arena, exploding in a massive AoE that poisons you and stuns you for a while. Depending on where the bulbs are, you can be stun locked and killed very quickly. Definitely focus the Arcaspores first to make the fight more straightforward and allow yourself to focus Gratore a little. He's pretty tanky and you can get help from Francois, so you'll have some help, but that doesn't really make it much easier. He kinda just acts like a distraction. Number 20, Opinicus the Archgriffin. This Archgriffin has traded health for damage, but it's yet another reskin, so I can't say much about it. I'll repeat myself though, the Archgriffins are extremely punishing for getting close to them, cause bleed so you can't heal with Swallow, fly into the air to spit poison at you, which also stops you from healing with Swallow, and Opinicus is the most egregious example of this being irritating. The only thing that makes this fight easier than its predecessors is its small health bar. It's eaten a beast blood pellet or something and has traded its health for absolutely insane insane damage. This boss will absolutely one-shot you on Death March and is the most punishing boss outside of the top 10. The caveat is that you've been fighting a bunch of Arch Griffins before this, so you'll probably have a lot of experience and knowledge on what attacks you can and cannot punish yourself. But if you're like me, you suck at the game and by extension suck at fighting these birds. I strongly remember dying to this guy multiple times on both of my Death March playthroughs and now it's the bane of my existence. Number 19, the Wraith of Iris Von Everick. It's our final Wraith reskin, and it's arguably the most creative and forgivable reskin they've done. In a dark, twisted arena, you fight against the Banshee manifestation of Olgierd Von Everick's wife, Iris. As usual, Yerdin is an extremely valuable spell that will slow her down and allow you to do some pretty significant damage, but at many intervals or at time limits, Iris will open up a painting and absorb green energy from it. This does a very good job of telling you that it's healing her, and to stop this you have to ignore Iris temporarily and walk up to the painting and smash it with your sword. These heal her at quite a rapid rate, so you have to deal with them as soon as possible. She's also got quite a bit of health in comparison to other raids and banshees that makes this even more important. Depending on your damage and how quickly you can destroy these mirrors, the skirmish with Iris can be extremely lengthy and very difficult. Two other things that make this more tricky is that she goes invulnerable when she calls for the healing, and there's absolutely no limit on how many mirrors she can absorb from. Do you need any more reason to take out these mirrors yet? Number 18, Cloud Giant. Who are we fighting up here in the clouds, Nameless King? The fight with the Cloud Giant above the Land of a Thousand Fables is one with a very tough opponent in a gorgeous arena with lightning bolts striking down on the Giant's questionable decor. The majority of the Giant's swings are pretty standard. He wields a large pickaxe looking thing and swings that on the ground in your direction, punches you with his free hand, and just swipes all over the place in hopes to deal damage. The thing is though, is that just with the Cyclops and the other Giants in the game, the hitboxes on these attacks can be extremely ungenerous and as expected from a ginormous metal pickaxe hit like a bus. This giant in particular has some unique attacks where it dives into the clouds and pops up elsewhere to attack you with a very fast swipe. That's about it though. The unpredictability, similarly to that of the old spear tip, can add a deceiving amount of difficulty, and as someone that's experienced it a lot, being squished by this thing in one hit is almost entirely unpleasant. 
Number 17, Monster of Tufo. One of the more unique bosses in the game, the Monster of Tufo is a red and white shell mar residing beneath the winery in Tucson. You'll notice with this monster that his back won't take any of your damage similar to Rock Trolls, but their front face is exposed and will take some decent damage if you swing at it. Obviously, the shell mar isn't easily just going to let you do that. The gimmick to this boss is that you have to survive its standard swiping attacks until it decides to roll forward at you. If you can dodge this roll and cause it to hit the wall, it will stagger and lie on the floor for a few seconds, completely vulnerable to any attacks you throw in its direction. Obviously, this is easier said than done, as the creature is incredibly fast and will hit very hard with its roll if you don't manage to dodge it. You have to roll it as well, you can't just sidestep it unless you get really lucky with spacing. It doesn't have the most HP in the world, but only being able to attack it when it's groveling on the floor after rolling into the wall makes it pretty difficult and lengthy. Number 16, Fugus the Devil. Alright, let me explain. I don't think anyone will agree with where I put this thing, but I swear to god, I have never I've been one shot by an attack that deals DOT in this game before like I have from Fugus. He breathes fire at you, and not only does this burn you and deal damage over time, but it also absolutely destroys your health bar if the actual flamethrower hits you. Not only this, but he can very quickly throw a ball of fire in your direction that will one shot you on death march, and his health feels like triplicates on difficulty change. It's just another example of a boss that tanks every hit you throw at it on high difficulties and throws back attacks that just obliterate you. Again, the justification for this may be a little strange, but anybody that's played this game on Deathmatch should understand what I mean. Number 15, Goliath the Giant. One of the most memorable bosses in the game for me, as it's the very first one immediately upon starting the Blood and Wine DLC. Goyat is the first challenge thrown at you after giving you an incredibly saturated cinematic of the beautiful land of Tucson. But he's just a reskin. I'd say he's the coolest looking, but it doesn't excuse the fact that it's actually just a reskin. This one can be compared most to the Cloud Giant. It wields a massive weapon that shreds your health bar and is super, super bulky. You do get help for this one from Milton, Depeyrak, Perrin, Palmer, and Delonful and Guillaume de Lawnful. But once again, the only useful thing they really do is distract the giant. And hey, why don't I repeat myself? The reskins are lower on the list because they hit harder and have more health. Didn't want to mention it, but I will. There's actually a pretty easy way to one-shot this guy. The giant is a reference to the biblical legend of David and Goliath, and you get an achievement called David and Goliath for shooting him in the eye with a crossbow bolt. This will instantly kill the giant regardless of what health he has and obviously makes the fight a joke. But I didn't really want to consider this when making the ranking, so he's further down. Number 14, Tarazane the Elemental. You just need to take one look at the thing to understand why I say this is arguably one of the most bulky bosses in the entire game. Terrazane, whose name is a reference to World of Warcraft, is an earth elemental that resides underneath the Moldavi residence. After destroying the columns that supported its invincibility barrier, you battle it out with the Brute. This is also a very memorable boss fight for me because each time I've fought it, it's been quite a long and tiresome battle. Terrazane has a lot of attacks in its arsenal, a lot of them involving punching the ground and conjuring rocks from the ground in your direction. He adds an AoE to a lot of his punches that increases their reach, and this never really feels unfair, and just like the other golems and elementals, Tarazane will guard himself frequently with his arms that will absorb all damage you throw in its direction. On top of all of its defense that it has, it also has immunities to Igni, Ard, and Axie, so good luck using any of these to your advantage. When he reaches 30% HP, he gets twice as aggressive, starts summoning rocks all over the damn place, Demon of Hatred style to confine you into an even smaller arena, and will swing at you what feels like twice as often with slightly larger AoEs. Although it's fairly easy to get hits in due to how slow he is, the amount of health Tarazane has is crazy, which forces you to nail your dodges against his swings for a very long time. Combining all of these elements together makes a very long stamina game that requires you to always be on your guard and play as well as you can. Number 13, Slizzard Matriarch. There's something about these two lizard dragon things that just makes this fight amongst one of the most difficult and infuriating in the entire game. The fight starts off by fighting the Slizzard female, the Matriarch. Their attacks involve flying around and lobbing fireballs at you and chomping at you while they're on the ground. All of these swipes hurt like a bus and the fireballs will burn you and thus prevent you from healing the swallow. Much like Lud and Zorlan from Dark Souls 2, this is a fight with an enemy that has some pretty standard attacks reminiscent of that of the Arch Griffins and Basilisk in the list, so actually fighting the Matriarch itself could be pretty simple. However, at 50% HP, the Baby Slizzard joins the fight and this absolutely skyrockets the difficulty. It doesn't matter if their attacks are fairly simple, having two of them attacking you at once adds an insane amount of difficulty to a fight that, on paper, 
sniper is pretty standard. If there was just one of them, it'd be a pretty boring game of shoot them out of the air, stay glued to their asses, and keep on swinging that sword. But now you have to manage two of them. One could be flying in the air, lobbing fireballs at you from a safe distance, while the other could be hunting you on the ground to try and throw punches at you. And managing one while also making sure you aren't getting hit by the other is very difficult. You've really got to make sure you don't nonchalantly tunnel vision one of them for too long because you'll almost definitely get punished severely by the other. Their health is very generous and the damage they deal is high considering there's two of them and is one of the most egregious examples in this game of a boss fight where the difficulty absolutely skyrockets by simply making a number two instead of one. Number 12, Myrif the Ice Giant. Another surprisingly early game boss that will cause a lot of people trouble, the Ice Giant is probably the OG giant boss you fight throughout Witcher 3, and what a tough one this is. What really makes this fight cool are the cinematics that come with it. The fight starts off with him fighting just with his bare hands after you or this idiot wakes him up. The true example of a boss that acts somewhat like that of a tutorial for the game's bigger, bulkier, slower, hard-hitting bosses. The Ice Giant is a slow brute that delays some of his standard stomps and hopes to throw you off guard and mess up your dodge timings, and god damn it works. The punishment for falling for his trickery is an attack that really, really hurts. According to the lore of this guy and the other ice giants like him, they absorb power from blizzards and colder weather in order to reach the peak of their physical strength. And since this giant is located in Unvik, there's plenty of cold and blizzards for him to draw from. The first phase, as I said before, has him fight similarly to old spear tip the cyclops from earlier, but when phase 2 begins he goes crazy and starts wielding a large improvised flail that's made from a nearby shipwreck's anchor. This adds an absolutely disgusting AoE to all of his attacks, increases the damage they deal, reduces and mixes up the wind-ups, and also adds a deceivingly large range to them. Altogether though, the battle with Myrif is a brutally punishing one that acts as a tutorial for the game's bigger bosses, and I'm sure this one is one everyone remembers for kicking their ass a couple of times at least. Number 11, Heresy the Arrakis. This fight is oddly reminiscent of that of the Jinn from earlier. This fight seems uncharacteristically difficult, it almost feels unfair. And it feels this way unless you come here at least 10 levels higher than the quest suggested one. And I know I'm not the only one that feels like this, I'm sure. Maybe a lot of people arrive here under level, but when I fought this guy in the past, I've come here 2 or 3 levels above the recommendation on Death March, and I still just get one shot while wearing full bear armor. And this boss will one-shot you with almost every single attack it has if you have enemy upscaling enabled, just like the Jin. This boss also shares the relentlessness and mercilessness of the Jin, but to rub some salt into the wound, it adds a poison damage over time as well. This means that amongst all this crazy aggression, he will not let you heal with Swallow. So once again, the White Raffer's decoction is the only choice here. And just as you thought I justified it enough, it's a gank as well! He will summon young Arakai to help him in the battle, and on top of his aggression, this can make the fight more much harder and much more annoying. Honestly, I don't have very much more to say, and quite frankly, I think I've already justified this boss's placement just outside the top 10 enough. It attacks relentlessly, it's a gank, it poisons you, you need to be a very high level to stand any sort of chance against it, and at the end of the road, you barely get any sort of reward, and the game gives you a little blip of experience. Thanks, Project Red. Just entering the top 10, we have the Botchling. Now, my question is, are you surprised this guy's in the top 10? I seriously feel like this boss depends almost entirely on user experience, and I feel like 50% of people will agree with this boss's placement, and 50% will completely scald me for it. Considering how early game this boss is, it is absolutely brutal. It's fast, it scratches herd a surprising amount, it's bulky, the Baron is sat over there screaming like a baby while we're trying to fight his baby, he goes pretty much invulnerable for a certain amount of time to summon raids to come and gank you, and the game does not tell you at all how to counter this. Throughout the time that you're getting ganked by raids, you're probably not using Yurden since you have no idea what that really does, and that it turns raids into manifestation form in order to actually kill them, so you just sat there aimlessly swinging at them without dealing very much damage, and amongst all of this, the Botchling is healing his ginormous health bar at a concerning rate. There is a way to counter this by casting Axie on it. This is the only sign that actually does anything major to it, and it will retract the spikes for a while to stop it from healing and allow you to hit it without taking any damage. This sounds like it sort of trivializes the fight, but it introduces the aspect of sign managing. Because it hurts you a lot, you probably want Quen active as much as possible, so you have to make sure you have it active while also keeping Axie ready before it heals too much. 
I don't know. My justification may seem weird, but based upon my experience and a couple of my friends, the botchling is absolutely a brutal boss, and even if you disagree with him being top 10, I think he's unanimously one of the harder ones. He's definitely the first boss that got me stuck on my first playthrough, and if I remember correctly, he had me stuck for around 2 hours, all because I had absolutely no idea that Yurden helped with the raves, and that Axie could be used to retract his spikes. Number 9, Shalemar. In the Gladiator Arena in Tucson, Geralt and Baron Palmer and Delonful battle this monster. Considering the size of the creature, it can move around the arena, circumventing Geralt and Palmer in sword swings at blazing speeds that will also hurt you if it rolls inside you. Once it stops rolling, it will unleash a frenzy of attacks that throws up the ground from underneath you that stuns you for a long time and hits really hard. He unleashes up to five of these at once, typically three, and this is one of the few opportunities to get up to the Shalemar yourself and hopes to close the distance. He has one insane attack where he rolls up into a ball and starts rapidly spinning in the ground. I don't care what difficulty you are on, this attack will one-shot you if you're close to it, and you can bet that it will kill Palmerin. And even once you've closed the distance, good luck getting any substantial damage done. This is the Monster of Tufo. You cannot deal any substantial damage to it on its squishy front side and absorb any damage you send to its back. What you have to do is wait for him to do the rolling charge and try to bait him into hitting the wall. Successfully doing this will cause him to flail on the ground for a while and you can just wail on him. However, this is easier said than done because this thing seems to detect when it's getting close to a wall and will just turn away instantly and go immediately in your direction. Figuring out this gimmick while also withstanding the time between your punishment windows will take a long time and absolutely makes for one of the harder bosses in the game. Number 8, Ophiri Mage. Hooray, another bizarre boss to put in the top 10. I just love justifying these ones. I think I can get through explaining this one fairly quickly though, and I also feel the justification will be agreed with. The Ophiri Mage is the boss you fight right after another boss to come later on this list, and starts off as a gank with a bunch of standard Ophiri warriors, some wielding shields, other swords, and other spears, with the Ophiri Mage in the background throwing magic attacks at you. If you have a brain, you'll realize the first thing you would want to do to this fight is eliminate the ads. Once you've eliminated the ads, you're now in a skirmish with an enemy that can absolutely massacre you with many different attacks. Probably the best example of this is his whirlwind attack. I don't have any footage of Death March, but yeah, you'll get absolutely destroyed by this attack and it seems to be completely random in terms of where it goes, so dying to it feels pretty dirty. Along with this, you have the time to maybe get one or two hits in if you're lucky before he teleports, so this makes the fight extremely arduous and irritating. This fight is only really difficult because of the calamitous damage he does with his spells and they seem very sporadic and seem very haphazard in where they want to travel. It turns the fight into a very long slog where you barely deal any damage and get one shot by a lot of the attacks and from what I've noticed when doing research, I am definitely, definitely not the only person that feels this way. The sisters said you would come. They saw you arrive in the water's surface. They did not see the girl. But she is with you, is she not? Doesn't matter. You'll never get her. You fought bravely in the ruined keep, to the bitter end. I trust this time will be no difference. This boss exemplifies perfectly what it means when I say boss difficulty can depend almost entirely on the player. This is going to sound like bragging, but I personally have never had all that much trouble with Imlarith at all. Maybe it's all my experience in Dark Souls, but I find it's fairly straightforward to just dodge his very slow attacks, but god damn, I've lost count of how many times I've said this in the video but he hits so hard it makes me cry. So this is a fight where the game really wants you to be swift, rolling around and dodging his attacks as well as possible until you find a window to attack him. In phase one, he wields a giant shield and a mace. He'll turtle behind his shield if you're at a distance from him, so good luck being a pussy. Getting close to him obviously means you'll be at the mercy of his perilous mace swings and shield bashes, but thankfully many of these combos can be punished maybe for one or two hits if you manage to get behind him, but he can follow up on these punishments so quickly that if you go for additional hits, you will absolutely 
absolutely give you no time to react and dodge. And just because they're quick follow-ups, it doesn't mean they hit less hard than his other attacks. It just means you've got to take it easy in terms of how many hits you go for. A lot of his first phase is rinse and repeat. Try your best to strafe behind him and get a couple of hits in as his combos are ending, then back up to not get hit by the follow-up. Obviously, you can't just hit him from the front because of how he uses his shield, so you've got to get behind him if you want to get any damage in. Once he gets rid of the shield, though, oh boy. Imleth goes all Karanthir on you and starts teleporting all over the place, unleashing frenzies of mace swings as he does so, only stopping if he does a slam down attack that causes him to get stuck in the ground for a while. Although I never say I've never really had much trouble with Imlorith, I can't help but say that this phase can be chaos. You have no idea where he's going to teleport to, how many swings he'll do before or after he teleports, and if you get hit by any more than one of these, you're probably a dead man. Sometimes he'll teleport after he's swung his mace five times, sometimes he'll teleport in the complete opposite direction, do a spin attack, then teleport again instantly, and all of this is so difficult to keep up with, it can lead to almost instant death with how hard he hits. The only time you can punish him in this phase is when his mace gets stuck in the ground, as I mentioned earlier, and even then, your windows to hit him are so minimal, you're lucky to get two or three hits in before he starts doing his next round of teleports. If you need to back away and heal because he's bludgeoned you with his mace, this is made almost impossible due to the fact there's no handicap on where he can teleport, so just as you think you're safe, he's right back on your ass. All of this combined makes her one of the most punishing and demanding bosses in the game, but one of the best at that. Number 6, Wicked Witch. One of the most annoyingly difficult bosses in the game, the Wicked Witch is the first boss you encounter in the Land of a Thousand Fables. Right off the bat, I just want to say how much I hate this fight for the implementation of an enemy I mentioned earlier, Arcaspores. These things are so irritating and so hard to fight, and the Wicked Witch spawns them so frequently after she starts flying in the air. You'll notice as soon as you start the fight that dealing damage to her is made significantly more difficult by the fact that she's flying around all over the place on her broomstick, protecting herself with a magic bubble. Similarly to the arch griffins and basilisks before her, you can shoot her out of the air occasionally which will knock her to the floor and allow you to deal some damage to her. This is the witch, the only time you can do this is when she flies over you to spew toxic fluids at you because this is the only time she abolishes her bubble that otherwise makes her completely invulnerable. She does not do this while any arcaspores or primordial panthers are on the field so you can't just ignore them. Once you've knocked her down onto the ground her broom will try and attack you as well as the witch herself so you still got stuff to worry about even after knocking her down. You actually have a decent amount of time to deal damage to the witch, and she staggers fairly easily, so despite all that, you can absolutely get some decent damage done before she unleashes a big AoE with her pop that staggers Geralt for 6 seconds and allows her to teleport away, get back on her broom, and protect herself again. And yeah, I believe this bubble is completely invulnerable, and I don't think any signs or bombs can penetrate it. This boss is absolutely a difficult challenge when considering the ads she spawns, how much health she has, how limited your attack windows are amongst all of this, and how much damage she and her companions can deal. Arcaspores are some of the most irritating enemies in the game to fight, and the Primordial Panthers are so quick and tough to hit sometimes, they can definitely make for a tedious and difficult fight. Definitely a creative boss fight though, despite the Arcaspores, and I'm always excited for it when entering the Land of a Thousand Fables. Number 5, Caretaker. One of the most creative and one of my favourite boss fights in the game, the Caretaker is unanimously one of the most difficult boss fights in The Witcher 3 for quite a few reasons. At first, he's a fairly standard boss, swinging at Geralt with his broken shot in order to deal damage that has to be dodged and punished by either getting behind him or waiting for the end of his combos. Once his health goes down a little, he'll introduce attacks where his shovel glows blue before some of them, and he'll unleash one of many different crushing AoE attacks. I hate comparing these to Dark Souls bosses, but he really just feels just like one. All of these different AoE attacks have different windups and obvious tells that require you to really look at what these are, so you can establish exactly what attack is coming and what the method and direction of dodging is needed. Where this fight gets brutal is when he he reaches 50% HP. He throws out smoke all around him and blue spectres will start coming out of the ground. The caretaker will head towards these spectres now instead of you because every time he hits or kills one of them, he will heal a big chunk of his HP. This doesn't apply to just these spectres though. Anytime he hits you, he will also heal the same amount of health and he still uses the big AoE attacks against you. These AoE attacks can hit multiple spectres at once and so will regenerate twice or even three times as much HP than what he would just hitting you or one of the spectres. This fight really tests your damage per second to see if you can out damage how much he heals. A lot of people struggle with this, myself included, especially in high difficulties as his HP is inflated and your damage is not. The best way to deal with the fight is to take out the spectres yourself. They die in one or two hits, even on death march, and so many of them spawn at a time, but if you don't kill them, the caretaker's 
probably just going to regenerate his entire health bar, which is something you definitely do not want. The spectres spawn in waves, so as soon as you've taken out an entire wave of them, none will spawn for around 10 seconds, giving you a small window to deal as much damage as possible to the caretaker. There's one attack in particular where he swings his shovel vertically and gets his shovel stuck in the ground for a few seconds, which is another really good window to get some damage dealt to him. You also have to make sure you don't get careless during this fight. There's been many occasions where I've got him down to just a few hits from death, so I start tunneling him, which is bad because he'll just start swinging at spectres and healing more than I can damage him. Other than that, there's not much else to say. Almost anybody that has played this game on Death March will probably agree with me when I say the Caretaker is one of the most difficult bosses in The Witcher 3, and arguably one of the best, offering some awesome creativity and unique mechanics, especially in comparison to the majority of the bosses in the game. Number 4, Iris's Greatest Fear. This boss is going to be difficult to talk about because I'm still yet to talk about the boss they're based on, and I don't want to spoil that one as there's going to be a lot to talk about when we reach him. This boss does something with an even more difficult one that makes it slightly easier but still really difficult. It multiplies it by 7 and it removes 90% of its health. Saying this, it is still one of the bulkiest bosses in the game that hits just as hard as anybody else after it. The gimmick to this battle is that although he's been multiplied by 7, only one or two of them are active at any one time. If you're familiar with the Deacons of the Deep from Dark Souls 3, then you'll understand what the goal is here. A Dark Spirit possesses one or two of them at a time, making the ones possessed the only ones active and attacking you. You have to pay close attention to this, because if you attack one that isn't active, he will become active and make the fight a gank, which is something you absolutely do not want in a fight as difficult as this. On Death March, every single one of these enemies will one-shot you regardless of your armor, and I strongly remember my friend playing through this DLC for the first time in full cat armor and getting completely decimated by any one of their attacks unless he had Quen active. The combos they have are extremely long and difficult to read. Some are really short and some are really long, and this can make it extremely difficult to gauge when the combo will end and when you can get in and punish. You cannot really get behind him as the tracking they have is crazy and will most likely punish you unless you get far away from him, which also doesn't work because the combo is normally ended by the time you wrap behind him completely. Yerden is absolutely one of the best signs to use and is arguably more useful than Quen for this fight. Slowing down their combos and their already somewhat slow movement can sometimes be more valuable than being allowed to tank one single hit. If you've put any upgrades into Yerden, they can sometimes last long enough that you can use it alongside Quen as well for the best chance of succeeding in this fight. The brutality of this fight really comes from the deceiving amount of damage they deal, how long it lasts, and the possibility of it being the most difficult gank fight in the entire game. Number 3, Detlaf the Vampire. A lot of people's favourite and highest regarded boss fight is absolutely one of the best in the game, offering the most phases of any battle throughout. You actually fight with Detlaf early in the DLC under the well-recognised name The Beast of Beauclair. This is a good introduction to the first phase's relentlessness, throwing brutal flurries of swings at you that deal a lot of damage and make dealing damage to him very difficult. But you aren't supposed to win this fight and your good friend Regis comes along to assist you in the battle, causing Detlaf to flee until you meet him again near the end of the DLC where stuff gets a little bit more real. Detlaf returns this time with even more lust for blood. You've already battled this first phase, but considering you weren't even supposed to survive the Beast of Beauclair encounter, you're likely still pretty inexperienced with this one. He dashes around the arena, venting some extremely fast claw swipes at you that feel almost impossible to parry. Where he teleports is random. He can just teleport in front of you, just behind you, away from you, to your side, pretty much anywhere, which means you have to make sure your reflexes are fast enough to react to whatever he does. If you manage to get behind him and get a hit in, he's just going to dash forward and turn around, which means you cannot get any more than one hit in reliably. Although it does give you some assurance on what he's going to do next, and you can't get any hits in from the front because he's a deflect god and will just swipe right back at you. This phase doesn't last all that long and shouldn't take you too long to get used to, but when you've whittled down his health bar a little bit, he goes all Genichiro on you and he transforms into a demon gaining the power of flight and conjuration. He will teleport close to you before swiping down at you Demon Prince style and start summoning bats in your direction. These bats have a deceiving audio effect that makes you think you have to dodge at a certain time when it is in fact much later, so you have to adapt to this during the fight or risk getting too shot by the attack. This one took me a while to get used to and I know it gave my friends a couple of problems as well. The attack you really want to punish in this phase is the one where he slams vertically onto you. He just lets you hit him for a while before unleashing another AoE attack and 
jumping back up again. Most attacks in this phase are well telegraphed and can arguably be considered easy to dodge, but certainly on Death March, the amount of damage he deals with the attacks is almost guaranteed to one or two shot you. This phase also doesn't last all that long, and just as you think it's over, he bites you, ingesting some of the toxic in Geralt's blood and conjures a disgusting arena made of arteries and capillaries, hatching himself from a bulb and attempt to rejuvenate himself. The goal of this phase is to destroy the four sacks at the sides of the arena as they deplete Detlaf's health bar, all while trying to avoid his last ditch efforts to try and kill Geralt. I may have made this boss sound easy, but in amongst all of these phases, he deals ridiculous amounts of damage with attacks that have a very wide range of wind-up lengths and methods of dodging. Getting used to all of them will definitely cause almost all players quite a few deaths. The fight goes from a fast-paced deflection game to a slower-paced patience game, ensuring that you nail and get used to the dodge timings of his attacks, and although individual phases may not last all that long, a fight with essentially four phases total can be a very tough stamina game. Certainly one of the best and most memorable bosses throughout The Witcher 3 is a fantastic and satisfying way to finish one of the best DLCs I have ever played in a video game. Number 2, Toad Prince. On the other end of the spectrum, we have one of the most abysmal and unfair bosses throughout the entire game. This boss is just awful and I don't know how to explain how awful it actually is. I know I'm not the only person that feels this way, but in my opinion, this boss feels uncharacteristically difficult compared to almost every single other boss in the game, except for one, obviously. This boss feels like it's taken every single enemy in the game, taken their health, and put all of it into its own health pool. This monstrosity living beneath Oxenfurt will one-shot you through a quench shield with a few attacks that have some of the most ungenerous tells and hitboxes, and I cannot promulgate this to you any more than I already have. It's the most egregious example of Project Red utilizing the bullet sponge mechanic while simultaneously giving a boss access to some of the most disgusting and hardest hitting attacks in the entire game. And if you thought getting one shot was awful enough, the entire arena can be absolutely slathered in poison that will almost immediately dissipate your quen and deal damage over time, once again adding to the plethora of terrible attacks this frog has. The DLT is also bad because even if you can tank a hit from this guy, he'll probably deal upwards of 95% of your health bar, so even having a tiny bit of your health missing will mean you'll die on the next hit. You obviously only have a limited amount of healing for this battle, and with a health bar as monstrous as this one, it means you have to get hit as little as humanly possible. You can argue that Igni makes this fight a lot easier with the poisonous gas being flammable and with the explosions dealing quite a generous chunk of damage to the frog, but when are you going to have the opportunity to cast Igni when the only chance you have of surviving this stamina game is to keep Quen active as much as possible? I don't really know what else to say, honestly. This is probably my least favorite boss in the game due to how massive its health bar is and how boring the fight can be. It's not even like it's hard but fun, which a lot of the bosses in this game are. It's long, tedious, demoralizing, irritating, and probably embedded in a lot of people's memory as being a boss that kicked a sorry ass like no other boss in the game. But that is, of course, still less than the final boss on this list. But before we get on to the final boss, I'd just like to say that I stream regularly over at my Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash mynameiscosmic and I would love to see you there. And the title of the hardest and my favorite boss in The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt goes to the legend himself, Olgird Von Everick. Oh man, what to talk about first. This boss is the opposite of the Toad Prince in the fact that he's brutally difficult for all the right reasons. He's a very good balance of insane difficulty while still being a very fun battle. Olgird uses demonic powers given to him by the Man of Glass and utilization of his enchanted Ophiri Scimitar to apparate short distances and unleash devastating power attacks at Geralt that will almost definitely one or two shots. You. He has many long and unpredictable combos that end arbitrarily. Sometimes he'll swing twice, sometimes he'll swing 20 times, and it's really difficult sometimes to gauge and predict when his combo ends for you to go and deal some damage to him. Doesn't matter what level you are either, his attacks deal a brutal amount of damage despite the fact they are quick flurries, feel almost impossible to deflect to deal any damage to him, and you get barely any breathing room to try and reposition yourself. The footage really doesn't do this fight justice. I'm actually pretty good at this fight because of how much I fought him after him kicking my ass for hours upon hours upon hours. The only real windows you have to attack all geared are the ones you get by staggering him by deflecting his glowy red attacks or attacking him after he throws sand at you. You can get behind him for a bit, much like that laugh, but good luck getting more than one hit in. Attacking him directly just means all of your swings get deflected and deal no damage to him, so there's also no point in doing this. The fight unkindly requests that you risk everything to nail deflect timing, something that I would say not a lot of players commonly do in The Witcher 3 as a high risk, high reward method for the fight. He does stagger for a while and let you get quite a fair amount of hits in if you do manage to nail the deflection, but regardless of your level, you'll deal such little damage to him, the fight 
fight is going to be very long regardless. I prefer the method of getting behind him and getting hits in as it removes some of the unpredictability from the fight and also means I'm not really risking my entire health bar for one deflection. Not to mention that Olgird has access to many of the red glowy attacks that all have different tells similarly to the caretaker and all of them will need different deflection timings and this makes it far more difficult. Yurden is useful for this as always, slowing down his attacks to make the deflections easier but it's still so much easier said than done. Adapting to Olgird's merciless combos can be difficult and although a lot of the standard swings can just be blocked without much effort, he can follow up very quickly with some perilous swings that are very dangerous if you're not prepared for them. All in all, this fantastic skirmish between two Master Swordsmen is an accelerating battle that offers a massive amount of difficulty for people interested in the challenge. It's accompanied by some of the best music in the game, has an amazing atmospheric battle arena and is truly one of the best battles the game has to offer. My only complaint about it is that he has so much health it can make attempts at fighting him quite exhausting. Just like in the Toad Prince, you have a very limited amount of healing and when versing a boss with such an enormous health bar that does the amount of damage old gear does, one hit early in the fight can exhaust almost a third of your healing depending on what you have. But that certainly does not stop it from being one of the best and the hardest boss in The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. Well everybody, it's certainly been a long one. Thank you for watching up until this point, even if you just skip to the end bosses. Now please do be aware that there is a possibility I may have missed a boss or two. Please excuse me if I have, as this game is such a massive range of quests, side quests, Witcher contracts, and optional encounters, it's pretty impossible for me to ensure that I've got them all. Ranking the difficulty of 90 bosses is also extremely difficult, so please forgive me if some of the rankings seemed absurd in your opinion. But at the end of the day, please do remember this video is just my opinion and is in no way objective. If you enjoyed this video, I've also ranked the difficulty of the bosses in other games such as Dark Souls, Bloodborne, God of War, Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice, and the Prince of Persia trilogy, and these can all be found on my channel. Thanks again for watching everybody. My social media is in the description if anybody is interested. I hope you enjoyed and I will see you all next time.